We're joined now by Deepa Govinda Rajan Driver, an activist for Assange and a university lecturer who's been on the ground during the hearings for Assange in the last few months and was on a public access call this morning during the latest hearing in which there was a debacle where the lawyers in the case, both the prosecution and the defense, were inaudible to the press and to the public who were accessing the dialing calls and listening to the proceedings. Today's court hearing was held for the most part via telephone conference whereby journalists called in on one line and the lawyers were on another line. The lawyers could not be heard and the line was really poor. There were multiple announcements interrupting proceedings as journalists joined and left the call. It was a fiasco with journalists vocalizing complaints of inaudibility and chaos. It got to the point where the court clerk had to repeat every sentence the legal counsel uttered in a stop-start manner uh, in order for us to hear what was actually going on. When it came down to discussing when the hearing would continue, the judge spoke about using imaginative and technological ways to conduct the hearing with a view to having the hearing on the 18th of May as planned. But then she did actually accede that it wasn't viable. Uh, thankfully, because as we listened, albeit barely and in utter disbelief, we were experiencing the ridiculousness of these said imaginative and technological ideas. So it was agreed that it would be pushed back, least of all because Julian's legal team has not had access to him for over a month. The hearing will be moved either to a bifurcated hearing in July and August or a continuous one in November. Judge Baratzer was able to be heard, but no one else pretty much was. It seemed that she was able to hear the lawyers. Uh, Deepa, could you run us through your experience this morning on the call and, and what you were able to hear? Today, Julian was unwell, so he wasn't in the dock. And Julian's lawyers, I understand, were participating through a conference line. There were two conference lines open. One specifically for the lawyers, the prosecution and the uh, defense, and one for journalists, and I believe in the interests of open justice, public-minded citizens were given access today. On this call, if you can imagine, you know, you're sitting in a room, you, you're the judge, you have these two discs in front of you, one's a speakerphone from the lawyers, one's a speakerphone with the journalists, you can hear both quite clearly and so can the court official in the well in front of you. They can hear things quite clearly. But anybody who's dialed into a conference call knows how hard it is to hear when people are speaking in the first place, even when they're relatively close to the phone. But to hear on the journalist's line from in another speakerphone is quite unusual and difficult. It doesn't lend itself to people actually, the journalists actually hearing what was being said in court. You couldn't hear Ed Fitzgerald. And then they decided this quite complicated process where the judge suggested that Ed Fitzgerald would say something, she would then repeat it, and then the journalists could hear it. And she would then repeat it in summary, which, which means really that the journalists couldn't hear the full arguments. And she was suggesting that maybe Ed Fitzgerald could share his notes with them. And I, it, is, it is quite a complicated case and the, the way in which things are arranged means that it's important for people to have real-time information, especially if they're reporting on it. Were there any other thoughts from the public access call today that you'd like to share with us that you felt were of significance? I'd also just like to ask you the percentage of the proceedings that you were able to understand. I think because I had heard Ed Fitzgerald's arguments last time around in court, I could make more sense of them than somebody who would potentially be coming cold to the call because on that call you had every time somebody joined the call or left the call, it would say, so-and-so is joining the call, so-and-so is leaving the call. And this would happen while Fitzgerald was talking, which meant that it spoke over him. So I, I'd say you could hear clearly about 10 to 15% of the call at max. I don't really think that that was a well-run call or a well-chaired call in the sense that there was no check-in points where you could say you couldn't hear it. There was, I think, once when we were asked whether we could hear. And there was also no... You would expect that 
they would be able to mute everybody who was on the journalist's call. And they weren't muted. People were typing away, talking about their coffees, and you couldn't, you couldn't actually hear what was going on as a result. So, yeah, it was not a, not a very good call, I'm afraid. Well, no, that's exactly why I asked, because I think that it's important that people do really understand how limited the call was for journalists and members of the public. I think there's also a danger that people will think, well, you could just go into the court then. But the court rooms are very limited in size. And many of the seats at the moment, because of COVID, are taped off. <laughs> so in order to observe social distancing, only five journalists and five members of the public can get into the courtroom. That is if these people can make their way from wherever they live to the courtroom. And this is in Westminster Magistrates Court, which is slightly easier to access, whereas at Belmarsh Magistrates Court, it's even worse. Shall I tell you a little bit about what happened in court today? Would that I, be helpful? I, that would be wonderful. Please do. Okay. So... <laughs> What was really ironic was the judge was talking about how important the administration of justice is and how the government is seeking to keep courts open. And she was talking about the administration of justice in the interest of the person who is in prison, how urgent it is. She called upon the lawyers to use imaginative and innovative methods at this time of crisis to participate, to confer with their clients, to continue to attend hearings, etc. She talked about the unsuccessful attempt to take Julian's instructions at the last court hearing. And she talked about the dangers of the video conference room. And she also talked about the consideration she had given to remote attendance by journalists. And she said that witnesses and journalists could be expected to participate remotely. So her argument in that sense was that it was perfectly fair to go ahead with the hearing in the current kind of conditions because any expert witness uh, or any journalist could just dial in. And this is quite interesting that she made this argument having not really recognized, despite journalists telling her that they couldn't really hear what was going on in the courtroom. So the technology, yes, of course, there is technology there, but the technology wasn't really working in the way it should. And at the end of all of this, she said that she was vacating the May hearing only because she felt that there was a need for Julian to be able to participate physically in that May hearing, and that might not be possible while the prison was in lockdown, and that it was close enough to the date for her to take that judgment now. She thought that when they asked previously about it, I would say 10 days ago, it was a bit premature. So now she was at the point where she says it's relatively likely that the prison is going to continue to be in lockdown for the hearing. So she's, which I think she was trying to make a point that she was being reasonable and measured about the way she was applying the decision to vacate the May hearing. And that was on May 18th, just in case the audience wasn't aware. That's when it had been set to move forward. Yeah. So three weeks away, pretty much less than that. The next point that they discussed was whether the July hearings would go ahead and what would take place in the July hearings. And then she said that there were two options available. They could have two weeks in July and one week in August or three weeks continuously in November. And they decided to adjourn the hearing at that point so that Ed Fitzgerald could communicate with Julian and find out what he would prefer. So at this point, the next minor procedural hearing will be on May 4th to decide which of those dates to continue with, as I understand it. That's did, right. you, did you manage to hear anything else that the lawyer said about the timing of these dates or what they preferred? Uh, no, I don't recall them saying anything specific other than the judge saying to them, don't you want to consult with Julian before you decide? Right. So... I think the aim was to allow them to take instructions, but given that Julian was, is not able to communicate with his lawyers, it's quite tricky, I assume. Absolutely. And I was going to also ask you about if there was any mention of the UC Global case. If the audience members don't remember, that's the Spanish firm that spied on Julian Assange in the embassy and had uh, ties with the CIA in doing so for years. Yeah. So 
they actually uploaded their files from the surveillance of Julian directly onto CIA servers is what I right. heard from the Spanish testimony. So it makes it quite clear that Julian's privileged conversations, conversations that are meant under the law for him to have private with his lawyers were spied on, but also could have been used in preparing the US government's case against Julian. So I was very disappointed today to find that we're still making the same arguments and the arguments are about changing the date of a hearing rather than saying this non-violent, peace-loving person who is not a threat to the public should be allowed to be with his family at a time of a grave crisis and a pandemic. And anybody who doesn't want to be alone at home during the time of the pandemic, who feels lonely, who feels sad, can imagine what it's like that the first for several months of Julian's stay in Delmarsh prison was complete and utter isolation. And this is, even now, he's in lockdown 23 and a half hours a day. And this is absolutely tragic. Absolutely. And we can thank Nils Meltzer, the Special Rapporteur on Torture for the United Nations, for exposing the depths of psychological torture that Julian Assange has been, um, you know, the victim of. So, yeah, definitely incredibly relevant. It brings a question to mind as to whether the hearings in November are so far out, if, if the date were to be set in November, would that not be so far out that his lawyers would then have an avenue to argue once again for bail because he has not been convicted? The judge has always taken the position that Julian is a flight risk and she has based it supposedly on past behavior. Now, I was looking at some of the old judgments, including the judgment that the judge gave when Julian was sentenced, when he was taken, you know, violently dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy and sentenced. One of the things the judge says in that judgment, which is public, is that what Julian did was disrespecting the system and disrespecting British justice, and that he actively sought to hide in the Ecuadorian embassy in order to prevent justice from being delivered. And I think the case now, the judge takes the same view, that because he has Bail jumping is a very minor offence, right? To give somebody 52 weeks for bail jumping is an indication of the anger and the frustration of the judges with what they think he has done. It is also an attempt to give him a punishment for transgressing their ideas of how Julian should behave. But one of the things the judge said in that statement was about how there was no real risk about Julian being extradited to the US. And now I think that Judge Baretza should really consider the real risk that Julian faced within the Ecuadorian embassy of onward extradition to the US, the real compromises that he faced in terms of his own privacy and his needs, and also the fact that the US government has been actively spying on him. And as a result, I think a bail application should also consider the fact that prior to him moving to the Ecuadorian embassy, Julian was very regular in presenting himself for his regular check-ins as somebody who's taking bail. The reason he stopped that was because he sought asylum. And the seeking of asylum is not a crime. And it is definitely a disproportionate sentence to suggest that, you know, for example, if you had a person fleeing persecution somewhere else, you would want them to be able to seek asylum and not be persecuted by the state from which they were fleeing. His human rights need to be respected and his right to seek that political asylum needs to be respected by the judge if she is respecting the rule of law. Well, Deepa, thank you so much for joining us today, especially as I understand that it's the day that you're submitting your PhD. So oh, best of luck with that. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me.